Welcome to Gavel to Gavel. I'm your host, Cobb District Attorney Vic Reynolds, and we're very excited to be back in the studio with our partners at TV23 for what I believe to be is our 16th episode of Gavel to Gavel. This is a show about the criminal justice system in Cobb County, and our goal is to educate and inform our viewers about a system that remains a mystery to most people. In the past, we've taken a look at how different courts operate in Cobb County, the probate court, the magistrate court, the juvenile court. We've taken a look at what happens if you're a victim of a crime. And in the future, we'll be looking at other issues that may affect you in the system. For example, what happens if you're selected for jury duty? But today, we're gonna to take an in-depth look at an interesting change in the criminal justice system, and that's accountability courts. These are courts that we're seeing popping up not only in Cobb and the metro area, but around the state of Georgia as well. And to help us do that today, I'm very honored to have uh, as our guest, not only a fellow colleague, but a friend of mine, Senior Assistant District Attorney John Persley. John is uh, an employee of the Cobb DA's office and is assigned to all of the accountability courts in Cobb County. John, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks. Let's start at the beginning. Let's tell the viewers a little bit about what an accountability court is and basically how they operate. All right. Uh, accountability courts are um, a relatively new uh, issue uh, in the United States and the state of Georgia um, in the criminal justice system. They seek to divert criminal offenders um, out of the traditional criminal justice system into a non-adversarial court system that focuses on treatment and accountability, sanctions and incentives to try to help the specific issues that these particular offenders may have. Would it, would it depend, I guess, uh, on what type of issue an individual may be uh, struggling with that may dictate what type of accountability court he or she may get into? That's right. Um, they, they primarily focus on two issues, um, and those are drug abuse, uh, which of course we all know about the opioid epidemic sure. that's, that's facing our nation and our, and our state in particular, and this area specifically, um, and also mental health issues. When I first um, started becoming interested in accountability courts, it was really the mental health issue that, that, that uh, first got me interested because of um, the fact that the criminal justice system, in my opinion, never particularly handled um, mental health uh, issues and th those offenders particularly well. Well, you know, we, we certainly pride ourselves in Cobb and, and in the criminal justice system as for frequently being on, on the cutting edge of new programs and, and uh, 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 one of the leaders throughout this state. But is, is this new program, Accountability Courts, is this something that we're seeing only in Cobb, only in the metro area, or are we beginning to see all, all over our state now? Um, the Accountability Court, um, accor Accountability Courts, really began, uh, believe it or not, in the mid-90s. Um, but they really started taking off only recently under Governor Deal's leadership with the um, criminal justice reforms. Um, our first accountability court in Georgia, um, start, I mean in Cobb County, started in the early 2000s. Uh, but there are uh, statistically, the statistics show there are 131 accountability courts in the state of Georgia now. Um, those are published statistics. I think that there are actually two more than that now. So I think there are 103 statewide. Uh, so it goes in, in every, there's one in every uh, jurisdiction in, Co in uh, the state of Georgia and uh, specifically here in Cobb. Um, we have, um, as you said, uh, we are on the cusp of, of that and when we always have been. And so um, we started, as I said, in early 2000s and then we put a couple more online just in the last four or five years. That's great. Well, in the second half of the show today, we'll really drill down into some COD courts and how they operate and how proud of them that we are. But, you, you know, you and I have been in this, uh, in this business a while. I've probably been in it a little bit longer than you, but we've seen changes come and go in the criminal justice system. And you mentioned uh, uh, an agenda uh, a, a moment ago called the criminal justice reform, where we're seeing some changes made in the system from the way it was when you and I began. Uh, accountability courts, I, I would presume, is that part of this criminal justice reform and that we're changing the way the system deals with people in certain circumstances? It's a big part of it. Um, when, when I first started uh, in the mid-90s, um, there were very few sentencing options available for prosecutors and judges. Um, it was basically 
prison or some type of prison, probation, and, and that's it, mm -hmm. really. Um, now there are a number of other options, and a big part of that, a big part of that, is the are the accountability courts. Yeah. Well, you know, ha having um, talked about where when we started in, and I was actually began in in the mid to late '80s, and so I've been been in it a little while. Prosecutors did just that; they prosecuted, and that's what right. you did. I know you you started in Athens, Clark County, and you've been in Cobb for a long time, and you're a senior prosecutor now. Your role in, in an accountability court, it, it, would, it would seem that it would change from what a typical prosecutor's role is. Do you, do you have to view the cases differently than you did before? I do, absolutely. Um, uh, well, as I said, used to be it was, can we, can we punish this person? Mm -hmm. um, but now uh, we've started to see, uh, the statistics have shown um, that in certain circumstances, uh, w that just punishing people wasn't affecting recidivism rates. And these accountability courts can uh, really affect the recidivism rate. Um, and the statistics have shown that people that complete one of these courts are much less likely to offend uh, than had they just been on probation or had they just been to prison and gotten out. Well, you know, that's, that's obviously our goal. We, we don't want people to come back. We have enough right. business as it is, and we don't want people to come back to the system if we can find a program that works. Now, you, you're, uh, your assignment, as we mentioned a moment ago, is accountability courts. That's what you do day in and day out. But obviously you have to have judges to make the system work as well. Are judges assigned to accountability courts in Cobb? In other words, do we have extra judges just to run the programs? Uh, each of the courts in Superior Court have one particular judge that's assigned to them. Uh, judge Krieger is assigned to the Drug Treatment Court. Um, judge Mary Staley Clark uh, is assigned to the mental health court, and Judge Reuben Green is assigned to the Veterans Accountability and Treatment Court. Uh, so we don't have any extra judges that, um, there's no extra money that's going into those programs, in, in other words, uh, it's just our normal judges that take on really extra work because they believe in those programs so much. Uh, our chief judge, also Tane Kell, is um, involved in a newer program that we'll talk about, I think, in a little bit, um, mm -hmm. called our Intermediate Drug Treatment Court. and. Uh, he also backs up Judge Krieger in the drug treatment court. So these judges are, are, are not only running their calendars and taking care of their cases, they're taking on these extra assignments as well in running accountability courts. Is that a fair statement? That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll say there's, there's in Georgia a, a, a body called uh, the Council of, a, a Council of Accountability Court Judges. And um, Judge Mary Staley Clark is on that council, uh, as is uh, Judge Reuben Green. So it's a it's it's just a handful of judges, and Cobb County has two judges on that council because, once again, because I think they have seen uh, in running the, their, their two courts that uh, it's an important part of the criminal justice system now. It changes people's lives, um, and they feel so strongly about it that uh, they wanted to be a part of the leadership statewide. Well, that's, that's great, and I think it bodes well for this county, and, and it indicates our willingness to, to, to try new programs and to get involved. Let's, let's, be, let's talk a little bit of practicalities and logistics of, of an accountability court. Let's say that uh, there's an individual uh, who uh, is involved in the system. He or she is arrested for a criminal offense. And uh, they decide through their lawyers, they need to be in an accountability court. They may have a drug problem, they may have a mental health issue, something of that nature. Is it automatic? Does it just happen because somebody wants to get in it? Is there a process to go through? How does somebody enter into an accountability court? Uh, there is a process. First of all, it's completely voluntary. Uh, in other words, we're not trying to strong arm people into uh, any of these programs because we have found that um, that doesn't work. Uh, they have to be, they have to want to be in these programs. Now we incentivize that and we can talk about those incentives later on, but um, it's a voluntary program. So what happens is they, the defendant along with their lawyer, fills out an application uh, and, a pet and they petition the court. Um, those petitions and applications come to the district attorney's office. Currently um, they come to myself and um, I take a look at those cases. Uh, if I think that they are appropriate for an accountability court, I send them to the appropriate coordinator. Each of the courts has a coordinator. Um, and um, at that point, they are assessed by some member of the treatment team. Um, it, uh, they then um, bring those each, each petition to the um, table, to the staff, and 
we decide it's not really a vote, it's more of a consensus about whether or not we think that person will be appropriate for, for um, a particular program. As, as we wind down this first segment before we take a break, it, it appears then from what you're telling the viewers that the DA's office is the literal gatekeeper of who gets at least sent to an accountability, uh, accountability court program coordinator. Is that accurate? That's correct. And if I take a look at a case and they have a criminal history that's, that's too, too bad mm. or they have a, um, or the facts of the case are just too egregious, then certainly we have a veto power and we mm. can say no and we don't even send those cases over for assessment. So in other words, so, some of these cases that people read about in the media or hear about, the violent, the tough cases, a murder, a, a sexual assault, right. somebody hurt a child or an elderly, those cases are not going to be considered for an accountability court. Is that no, correct? no. We're looking for people that have some sort of uh, issue that they can be treated for, whether it's a drug addiction or a mental illness or some um, combination of those two things. We're not looking for your hardened criminals. All right, great. Well, John, this, this, when we come back from the break, let's, let's narrow down and drill down a little bit into what we have specifically in Cobb and talk about our accountability courts here. So thank you for watching this first segment. Uh, we'll be right back on Gavel to Gavel with Senior ADA John Persley talking about accountability courts. Thank you. A boy born in Joplin, Missouri was fascinated by anything with wheels and a motor. The odds of him going on to fascinate millions with his talent? One in 260,000. The odds of this born racer having 157 career top 10 finishes in NASCAR? One in 125 billion. The odds of him winning both the Daytona 500 and the Brickyard 400 in the same year? One in 195 million. The odds of a child being diagnosed with autism? One in 88. I'm NASCAR driver Jamie McMurray, and my niece has autism. Learn more at autismspeaks.org slash signs. Welcome back to Gavel to Gavel. I'm your host, Cobb District Attorney Vic Reynolds, and today we're talking about accountability courts with our guest, Senior ADA John Persley. John, before we left for the break, we uh, were getting ready to talk a little bit about uh, specifics in Cobb County, what we have here. First of all, let's tell the viewers in Superior Court, in our court that you and I deal with day in and day out, what type of accountability courts are operating there? So our office is uh, intimately involved with three uh, accountability courts. We have the drug treatment court, the mental health court, 
and then the Veterans Accountability and Treatment Court. I believe you told the, the viewers before we took a break that is it the drug court that's the actual oldest court in Cobb? It is. It began in 2002. We currently have 103 participants, uh, at least 10 pending applications. Um, it's just interesting. Uh, four people are, are waiting to enter the program through uh, pleas. And then we have, to date, uh, from the beginning of the program to date, uh, 505 graduates. That is fantastic. So in other words, over 500 people have come through that program and successfully made it through. Is that That's correct? That's right. That's right. Now, generally speaking, so the viewers will understand, how, how long would an individual be in, in, in a drug court program here in Cobb County? Um, all of our, um, well, our, our, those three main superior court um, accountability courts have a minimum a time period of 18 months. So it goes from 18 to 24 months, roughly. Uh, some people last or are in the program a little bit longer. It takes them a little bit longer to get through the program, um, but it's a very minimum of 18 months. You know, it's, it's interesting in, in a sad way, and you and I have seen this firsthand being, being prosecutors and being lawyers. We, we went through a crack epidemic, late, late 90s, early 2000s. We began a methamphetamine epidemic, and now, as you mentioned earlier, we're in the midst of, of an opioid heroin epidemic. Is that reflected in drug court? Do you see those individuals with those specific problems coming through our drug court? Yes. Um, it's funny, or not funny, it's interesting. When I started in 94, that was the crack epidemic. And I first started trying cases, and they were crack cocaine cases. And then I remember seeing the methamphetamine start to come in, and it was, you know, every, the prosecutors would think, what is what is this new drug that we're that we're kind of starting to see, and now it's heroin, and and um, you know the hair. We are the center. Uh, Cobb County is is one of the centers of the heroin e epidemic in the state of Georgia. Um, we had more overdoses last year than every other county except for um, Fulton County. Well, before we move into the, our other accountability courts, obviously, and drug court's an interesting court, and it, it you and I know that individuals with addiction issues don't simply stop using drugs because they enter into a drug court. And so it, I, I would imagine that it would be common for somebody to relapse. Uh, if that happens in drug court, are they automatically kicked out of the program? How, how are they dealt with by the judge and by the prosecutor? Well, and that's one of the, to me, the best things about these accountability courts, uh, all of them, because we understand that an addict is going to relapse. Very few people actually make it through the program without some sort of relapse or some sort of problem. Um, if they didn't have a problem, they wouldn't be in that, they wouldn't be in the court. Mm -hmm. um, so when that happens, um, we have sanctions. Um, so if a person tests positive, for example, uh, for drugs, and we do at least two to, we do two to three screens on them every week while they're in that program. Um, uh, if they test positive, sometimes they might get um, a day in jail. They might get three days in jail. They might get more. Uh, sometimes we send them to jail for a longer period of time and our, our sheriff has a work release program where they basically sleep at the jail but they're released every day to go to go to work. Uh, our sheriff in Cobb County has been a huge supporter of um, all of our accountability courts. So um, we, we take into account that these people have these issues and um, we treat them accordingly. You know, one, one of the courts you mentioned a little earlier before the break that, that's certainly a very interesting accountability court is one with, uh, that deals with people with mental health challenges. I, I had heard and I have heard this throughout the system that often local jails are, are the largest warehouser of people with mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And so uh, to tell us a little bit about our mental health court, who, who, uh, what type of individual enters into that program and, and the differences in that one, say, for example, and the drug court. Well, with mental health court, we're obviously looking for all of these people have, have run afoul of the law in some way. Um, it's usually a drug offense, a theft offense, uh, some low-level offense. Uh, however, it can be um, a, a minor violent offense in certain circumstances. Um, and we're looking for people who have committed these crimes because of uh, a severe and persistent mental illness which affects their daily life. So we're usually looking at people um, who have already been diagnosed in some sort of way or, who, or for whom we can send them to a doctor and have them diagnosed with some 
actual mental illness. Um, so that's, that's the, the basic that we're looking for with mental health court as opposed to a drug treatment court, which of course is the people that, are, um, that have ran afoul, run afoul of the law but who have um, a, a drug abuse problem. Currently, our mental health court um, has 36 participants. Uh, we're set up for about that many. So um, the demand for mental health court, uh, well really for all of them, but uh, for mental health court, I've seen in my time in accountability courts has been pretty high. Um, we have uh, had 18 graduates to date. It started in April of 2013. So it's been going um, about four years. That's good. It sounds like that the mental health court helps provide that structure and discipline for an individual to make sure he or she stays on their meds and things of that nature. It, it does, and all of our programs, and I, I try to emphasize this to people, um, they're tough. Um, it's not a walk in the park. It's not get in there and do nothing. Um, every single one of our programs requires a lot uh, in mental health court. For example, uh, they, they not only have to come to court once per week, they have eight group uh, therapy sessions per week. Mm. So four days a week they do two uh, a day. Uh, they're, screen they're screened for uh, drugs and alcohol uh, two to three times per week. Um, our other programs have very similar um, uh, requirements uh, and part of it is getting those people to work if they can work, um, keeping them busy with working or working on their GED or doing community service. Uh, you know, you and I get up every morning, um, we go to bed at a certain time every night because we have a routine. We have to get up in the morning, we have to be at work. Some people um, don't have those routines um, and sometimes it's because of a drug, drug issue or a mental health issue and part of what we do is to try to get them into those routines. It's an interesting court. I've seen it firsthand. Very proud of that court. But let, let's talk a little bit uh, about one of my favorite courts and that's the Veterans Court. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what we're trying to do in this county for those individuals who have served our country and, and perhaps have obtained some type of injury or some challenge as a result of their military service. T tell the viewers a little bit about the Veterans Court. Veterans Court is our newest um, full-time Superior Court uh, accountability court. I say full-time because we have a, an intermediate drug treatment court program as well. Um, but the Veterans Court started in 2014, June of 2014. Currently we have 26 participants three pending uh, applications. We've had 15 graduates to date. Uh, the Veterans Court um, is for people who obviously are veterans of our armed services um, and who have a mental health issue or a drug issue um, that is related to their service. In other words, uh, we're not looking for people who are criminals who happen to be veterans because those people do exist. Mm -hmm. We're looking for people who um, are veterans who have a mental health issue or a drug issue that's related to um, their service. Um, you know, one in five of the uh, veterans of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars is said to have PTSD mm -hmm. or a major depression. Um, one in six has a substance abuse issue. Um, about 320,000 statistics show have a uh, traumatic brain injury. Um, 22 uh, veterans of those two wars commit suicide every day. Mm. 22. Um, that uh, means that um, there are more um, there are more suicides really uh, per year than in. Than, in, than deaths from those two wars oh, overseas. It's such a shame. Uh, so uh, we're trying to do something about um, helping um, those people. So it's kind of, I, I look at it as a hybrid between the drug court and the mental health court because the people in veterans court have both of those, those issues. I would imagine too that, like you said a moment ago, a lot of dual diagnosis individuals in there yeah. dealing with both issues. You know, John, you, you, you've, you've been, I think, to all of them. I've been to uh, uh, one or two of the graduations at mm -hmm. Veterans Court. And is, is, is that open to the public? In other words, could our viewers come and see a graduation of Veterans Court? Absolutely. Um, Veterans Court graduations are uh, set, there's, there's usually 
two to three per year whenever we get enough graduates ready to go. Um, but they're open, they're an open court, and any of the viewers can come and see them. As we wrap up this show, let, let, let me ask you this last question. Uh, obviously, besides the obvious, uh, wanting to help an individual and wanting to make sure that his or her problems are dealt with in, in some way outside of the system, is, is there another proverbial carrot at the end of the stick for an individual to say, I'm going to, I'm going to get in one of these programs and complete it successfully? Right. To me, the most important part is the actual treatment. Um, but yes, um, if a person has never been convicted of a felony, um, and they end up in one of these courts, they can uh, potentially have their charges dismissed. So they can end up with no record whatsoever if they successfully complete the program. Others um, can uh, potentially complete the program and not uh, go to jail or prison. Um, so there are, there are um, treatment incentives and there are legal incentives as well. And those are the two of the things that help people, I think, want to do the program. Well, I know you're like me and, and you deal with it day in and day out because that's your job. I know you're very proud of those courts and the work they've done and the help they've provided people. And, and, and we're very honored in this county, very, very uh, um, happy to know folks like you are out there doing that. So thank you for being with us today on Gavel to Gavel, educating our viewers a little bit about accountability courts. We could talk about it for another hour, but <laughs> thanks for being with us today. Again, and to the viewers, thank you so much for joining us today and watching this episode of, of Gavel to Gavel. Until next time, I'm Cobb District Attorney Vic Reynolds. Stay safe. Did you know kids who play outdoors have healthier lungs? Totally. I did. Did you know that boys that play with dolls make better husbands? My son has lots of dolls. But did you know terry cloth diapers breathe better? I did. Mm -hmm. It's totally true. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you know that strollers have the right of way on the sidewalk? Yes. Yep, I did. Did you guys Did know? you know that kids who eat breakfast have higher GPAs? Yeah, I know. Okay. Yeah. That's actually what I was going to say. Did you know babies should never touch silver? It's really bad for them. I knew that. Did you guys know that statistically friendly kids have more friends? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's obvious. Did you know most people think they're using the right car seat for their kid, but they're not? Parents who really know it all know for sure that their child is in the right seat at the right age and size. Visit safercar.gov slash the right seat to make sure your child is protected. I'm putting that on my blog. I just put it in mine. The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Call or visit fatherhood.gov to learn more.